Yes, and on the line with us is uh, Charlene Wallace, Freight Director of Network Rail. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me today. It's good to have you. Um, you are not only the Director of Freight, you told me yesterday, you have a broad portfolio. Can you explain yeah. a little bit more about uh, what your responsibilities are? My current uh, job title is uh, Freight National Passenger Operators and uh, Customer Experience Director for Network Rail. Uh, and that includes looking after all the freight uh, responsibilities that we're here to talk about today. Uh, the national passenger operators are the um, operators like Cross Country and Caledonian Sleeper. We look after aspirant open access operations as well uh, and charters. And um, we also have the customer information strategy, uh, which is uh, an ORR directive from um, it, it works with the network rail, train operating companies, RDG. Um, I also have the network-wide managed stations portfolio for network rail as well. Not the operational side of things, that's part of the routes and regions. Yeah, sounds like a huge job. Um, I can only imagine that it's uh, hard to represent all and freight has always been a little bit in the shadow of passenger uh, traffic. How do you make sure that freight is represented well? I think for us, uh, network rail, would put their hands up to say that we haven't represented freight probably as well as we should have. Um, we addressed that with the Putting Passengers First campaign and we added in freight users, uh, much to the to the delight of our freight community. Certainly from my point of view, my role um, covers all aspects of customer. So customer for me isn't just about passengers, it's about our freight community, it's about our end users, it's about everybody who uses the rail industry. and. Uh, yeah, it, it's a great opportunity for me to actually bring freight to the table within a lot of the forums that it wouldn't necessarily have been um, addressed at before. Yeah, and is it more difficult to represent freight towards the government as well? Compared to passengers? Not necessarily at the moment, um, because obviously I know, you know, passenger services um, haven't returned to pre-COVID levels yet. We're not anticipating that any time soon uh, and I think it's a massive opportunity for us at the moment to actually look at every opportunity we can for freight. Certainly I know a lot of um, the operators are looking at um, light logistics, light freight options uh, and looking at different ways of travelling. People may not go back to commuting the way they did before so passenger services that are running may not be full. Um, so yeah, I think it, it's it's looking at staycations, people are travelling to different destinations. I think the industry is changing and fate has certainly got an opportunity. Uh, you know, in every crisis there's an opportunity, but I, I think over the last year fate has been buoyant. The market's been really good for us and um, certainly there's there's a lot of people who are very interested in freight now who maybe were thinking very much passenger first and foremost. Yeah. Now, there uh, has been a, a couple of an announcements uh, lately. There has been the, the East Coast upgrade and the Felixstowe and uh, Ali capacity enhancements. How much is this, uh, of this is driven by freight demand? Well, I mean, I'm glad they've made the headlines because they're all very significant. You know, in a freight context with all the kind of growth forecasts that we've had indicating that up to 60 freight trains per day could be needed in each direction to serve the port of Felixstowe, it's, it's better news for us. It's logical that the demands of such location will support business cases for work at locations such as Ely. In fact, benefits from the Ely capacity scheme are primarily freight related uh, as much as by 80%. So because it links into the UK's number one deep sea port of Felixstowe, so that nation's distribution heartlands at the key locations and the most significant growth artery for, for any freight in the country. Uh, and with the future of rail freight growth, expected to see high percentage of new business for ports such as Felixstone Southampton, which has also recently been upgraded to allow for longer freight trains. Any future programme with connectivity to major ports for freight generating locations will be key to encouraging modal shift and delivering much needed carbon reduction. Um, as for the East Coast, which is another key corridor for rail freight, um, we're operating close to full capacity and again the forecast show it's expected to grow even more. Uh, and the good news here is that the introduction of digital sig signalling can provide additional capacity here, which could be used to run even more freight trains on and improve the, the performance. Um, and at last but not least, the Warrington Dive Under, 
uh, which will support growth of freight to and from Felixstowe, Yorkshire and the North East by not having to cross that grade north of Peterborough where capacity and capacity is at a pinch. Uh, I think it's really good news for us. Yeah. Another uh, piece of good news may have been the, the speed project, which uh, is supposed to speed up uh, railway uh, enhancements. What does that mean for uh, the freight industry? Yeah, absolutely. It was a month ago it was announced. So Project Speed is all about taking time and I dare say unnecessary processes out of the enhancement schemes. It's about building back better but quicker too because uh, Network Rail have addressed that we need to be more agile um, in our response to things. Um, so if we can apply this to free, it's a win-win. Um, as well as reducing time, it will also reduce cost. And I think it's a testament to Project Speed that the Prime Minister gave a presentation at an industry conference last week. Uh, and he made it very, very clear um, that he has a massive confidence in our industry and the role that we play in supporting our economic recovery. Yeah. And how do you look at the HS2 project? Is that uh, something actually good for freight as they claim or is that something to be debated? Well, I'm going to be a little bit more formal here. So in line with the Department for Transport strategic case for HS2, once HS2 services from Euston are introduced, replacing most of our long distance services through the northwest and central area of England, uh, this allows the industry a choice to how to utilise the resulting release capacity for the services. Uh, north of True, the arrangements for Phase 2 show us there's a capacity for more efficient freight, um, and that will inc inc include growth um, going forward. The arrangements for Phase 2B haven't be really been confirmed yet, and uh, that's subject to review by our um, IRP. Uh, commissioned by the government. We expect there will be some capacity for more efficient freight paths and the arrangements will be set out by the HS2 Phase 2 hybrid bill and that's currently expected at some point later this year. Yeah. Okay, a lot of good is coming. Um, you actually didn't start uh, your job at this position a long time ago. It was uh, right when the pandemic started. How has this been yeah. for you? It was a bit of a baptism of fire, actually, because I started with Network Rail two weeks before the COVID crisis kicked in. So uh, for me, my background has been predominantly transport. Um, I worked uh, within train operating companies on, in operations and also within um, aviation. So when I came into Network Rail, I had experience of the other side of the fence. Uh, and I knew quite a lot of people already who had come in from different backgrounds, but certainly the reason I came in to, to join Network Rail was because at that point, Andrew Haynes had been talking about putting passengers and freight users first, and I really saw it as a point where we were going to have this new culture change, and then obviously the COVID crisis happened. But it was good for me because the, um, initially I was put on the COVID response uh, for Network Rail for the UK and that included a lot of the kind of freight logistics side of um, the business which was fantastic for me and it's been it's been great to see that freight has moved so many essential items and kept the country going you know throughout the pandemic so yeah it, it was a, it was probably not the way I would have anticipated starting a new company but it's been a, an absolute joy <laughs> and a good learning curve. Yeah. And, and uh, how is it to work as a woman in real freight? Because it's uh, an industry dominated by men, but you are in a, in a good position as a woman. How is that? Yeah, I, I think there are, there are more women now coming into freight, and I, I really encourage that. Um, certainly, I've been on a variety of different conferences, and they have asked me very similar questions. Um, when I started in the real industry, all those years ago, I was probably one of the few women at that point as well. So it's not the first time this has happened. We did see a bit of it, you know, at one point there was quite a lot of women and then all of a sudden it died off. Again. But I think the more we encourage people and explain what our jobs are about and how much we can make a difference, and actually we have got the skill set and the capacity to be able to do that, you know, in any job within the rail industry, then... I think more people will come or come on board. I mean, we, we've got fantastic women drivers, you know, who are in the freight industry now, and they've been out championing the cause for everybody as well. So, no, it's really, it's a privilege to be part of the freight community. It's a great place to be, um, and hope I can make a difference, actually, as well. Yeah. And do you think you do things differently than a man in your position would do? Um, 
I think within my own skill set, because of my background, I maybe look at things differently. I haven't been in the one job for, you know, forever. I've been in different aspects of the rail industry and transport. I, I, I can see things from a very commercial point of view. I try to be as innovative as I can be and look about, you know, finding solutions rather than problems. So, yeah, I'm trying to encourage my team to do the same with that as well. Yeah. Now, one last question uh, for us alone. What is the biggest challenge in front of you for Network Grill, in your opinion? I, I think at the moment, uh, the whole rail industry is changing. We need to have a voice in whatever happens next. I mean, we're all waiting patiently for a white paper to come our way. And certainly within our team, we're keeping close to the team who are working with the DFT and the reform team to make sure that we do have a voice for the future, that Network Rail are working really closely with our regions at the moment to, to make sure that although it's a devolved network, we are still seen as a network-wide provider. Um, and we want to make sure that, you know, we are putting customers and our freight users and, and the community, you know, end users first. So it is a challenge in current times, but I think, you know, we have to kind of stop looking rear view mirror and keep focusing on the future. And we've got lots of really, really good opportunities for free at the moment. So just being part of that, I think, is the key and, and keeping on top of it and make sure it's relevant. Yeah. Okay. 